ABC Radio Melbourne and ABC Victoria. You're with Lisa Leong. Good morning. Great to have your company this morning. And you may have just heard on the news, Judith Durham of The Seekers has passed away. Best known for Georgie Girl. You'll hear the whole song a little bit later in the show. But I'd love to hear your memories and reflections on Judith Durham and The Seekers. one 774 Did you see her perform? Maybe you knew her from childhood in Essendon or maybe you came across her because of her charity work like Elizabeth from Preston. Good morning, oh, Elizabeth. Good morning. Good morning. Um, look, Judith, um, I was a big fan of the Seekers and drove everyone nuts playing their music, um, including my brothers and sisters and whatnot. Um, but um, one of the things later on, I went to all the Silver Jubilee concerts in... Um, oh, was that in the 90s? Um, I can tell you. Hang on. Because uh, I think I went to them as well, but I actually can't remember. If anyone can remember exactly when... 1993. 1993. Well done. Well, You've got a better one. memory than me. And in, where I'm was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, was it in the concert hall? Yes. And then they had their um, golden jubilee, of course, 25 years later. And I can't remember. Oh, I haven't added up the date yet. But um, 93 was the first one, the re- reunion. Um, I kept going to them. It's, every time they announced a new one, I kept going to them. But um, one of the things that... Um, I, we were working with a, uh, injured nurses at the, at the time they had the highest injury rate in the female workforce and I, I don't think it'd be too far away now but um, um, one of the things that I we were running a, a group for injured nurses and one of the things I did at one of the concerts was approach Judith at the stage door which I'd never done anything like that in my life and I asked her if she'd consider being our patron and I had some reports and material to give her. We'd gone to the media, but we weren't getting much traction. And about a month later, she rang and said yes. And from yeah. that moment on, um, she um, joined us on all our functions. We ran a 10 year program of upgrading lifting practices throughout Victorian um, hospitals um, to decrease the injury rate. And Judith came to every function that she could um, and spoke or sang or um, and really lobbied for us and lifted the pro- whole profile and um, she's a great great person and very kind mm. and how will you remember her Elizabeth what was she actually like um, she's collaborating she's with her great and um, we did become friends and um, She is the person you see on the stage is the person you see um, in real life. You know, like when you're just going out. You know, like she's just a genuine good person. Incredible. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing your memories this morning. That's Elizabeth from Preston. Love to hear from you. One three hundred triple two seven seven four. As we remember Judith Durham this morning, you're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. And Normie Rowe joins us now. Good morning, Normie. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. A, a, a sad morning, obviously. How are you going, um, Normie? Oh yeah, look, I'm fine. I'm good as gold. But uh, you know. <laughs> The Seekers have been such a big part of of our lives, especially in Australia, but worldwide, um, that they almost gave you a, a, a notion that they'd always be there. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, Judy was... Um, I don't think she was travelling particularly well with her, with her health over the last 10 years or so. Um, but I went to see one of their concerts in Wollongong uh, not that long ago, and she was singing as good as she'd always sung. You know, Incredible. You know, always. And, of course, uh, that entity of the Seekers were the definitive professional entertainment uh, unit. It was it was, uh, it was wonderful to see them. They, they dressed impeccably. <laughs> they they performed impeccably. There wasn't any mucking around on stage, and 
you know, 10 minutes between songs and <laughs> didn't, throw, didn't throw any TVs out the window. Or, <laughs> and, you know, their success in the UK, well, I arrived in the UK just after them and, and I already knew uh, the Seekers because I, I as a, a teenager and a teenager pop singer, I go down to the treble cliff with Trotter, the drummer, who is still my drummer today. The just treble cliff in recently. South Yarra? The tre- treble cliff in South Yarra. We used to go down there after we'd finished playing the dances. And and um, I didn't drink coffee in those days. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I still did. Clean but, living for you, Normie. Uh, but I, but we, we just loved the, the music. They got on a, a ship... Um, to go to work their a passage to London, and they fell into the right management team, Eddie Jarrett and and Peter Gormley, the people from that the I had also, and Cliff and the Shadows had. Um, it, they the Shadows uh, and the Seekers were all good friends with each other, and um, and of course Olivia and and Pat Carroll. It was sort of a, our own little kangaroo valley, if you like. Um, uh, when when I was living in London, and I in didn't fact, you I, live, I, live I, in Ethel's apartment in London? Yeah, Ethel from yeah, the Seekers. You know that? that was interesting. You know that? <laughs> yes, yes. And a lot of funny things happened there. You know, I mean, where you just wouldn't expect it. But but uh, during that time, I went to see them at the talk of a town in London, and oh, it it just gave me impetus to want to do what exactly what they were doing it was fantastic you know, ah was, so kind yeah. of inspirational to see Aussie acts become global yes. and of course I came back filled in my papers for national service and that was the end of that but yeah. uh, you know sliding doors uh, but uh, not to get away from uh, Judith's uh, input I mean I think there were two or three occasions uh, when uh, Judith didn't want to go ahead any longer with the band, with the group, and and they had people uh, Louisa uh, whistling, and they had uh, Julie Anthony, and and as good as those girls really are or were at the time, um, they could they just weren't the unique uh, Judith Durham voice. I mean, she was she was there was no one else. Uh, that could sing those songs the way that Judith sang them, and uh, it's um, it's really sad for the entertainment industry. It's really sad for the people of Australia and the people who loved them, like that lady you had on just before me. Mm. And it's and I I can only feel um, a great deal of compassion for for Keith and and Bruce the the, the and Athel. Um, who he would, I guess it'd be almost like in many ways losing a, a limb. Mm. They, they were so, such a, a, a unique um, uh, bonding of, of uh, human essence that uh, uh, they touched everybody. It was wonderful. Now, Normie Rowe uh, on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria with Lisa Leong. Uh, describe when Judith was recognised in Central Park. I hear there's a story here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you've got all your, all your information. Yeah, so my much. spies. <laughs> Lisa, Lisa, we were on our way to um, Expo 67 in 1967 in Montreal, Canada, Canada and we sto- all stopped off at uh, in New York on our way through and stayed at the Warwick Hotel, which is a, just a short walk away from Central Park. So, oh, Central Park's really famous, and I didn't know it from a bar of soap. I might have been walking down Merry Creek. But I, was, I, was, I, I, I was this kid. It's green. You know, it's I, I was only about 17 or 18, wow. well, 18 or something. Anyway, we, uh, we went for a walk, and... I think it was Ackle turned around and said, hey, that's Dick Van Dyke <laughs> sitting on the park bench. Really? And, wow. And I was looking at the horse-drawn carriages, you know, <laughs> and I turned around and uh, the, the Seekers are walking towards Dick Van Dyke and I thought, oh, God, do you do this sort of thing? I don't know. <laughs> um, 
and and now I love it when people come up to me and they recognise. I think it's it's wonderful yeah. that they rec- recognise me for something nice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but but uh, I, I think it was Apple said, uh, Mr. Van Dyke, uh, we, uh, would you mind if we met you? Um, and he said, No, not at all. He was very friendly, and. Uh, he said, well, uh, we're from an Australian group called The Seekers, not thinking for one moment that anybody in America would know them. But Georgie Girl had just hit number one and they weren't quite aware of it. Oh, really? <laughs> uh, and he turned around and said, The Seekers from Australia, uh, you, you're the ones that do Georgie Girl. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, oh, wow. So there was quite a chat going on there. And um, and after that, uh, it was, I mean, you always think about those things, you know, the, the things that happen to you because you're lucky enough to be in show business. And uh, <laughs> and, and then, then we go off to uh, um, Montreal for Expo. And, of course, we had some of the greatest of Australian performers before before his fall to fall from grace um rolf harris who was an amazing performer uh beautiful barry crocker uh bobby lim whom i i still adore in his uh, in his absence and dawn dawn lake his wife uh george goller and um uh, 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 Anyway, there's, there was a whole lot of us doing the Australian thing there at uh, Expo 67. And uh, the word got around, basically, that the Seekers were on, so we had to sell our c- crowd oh. every night. No thanks for, to me. <laughs> didn't know me from a bar of soap, but they, <laughs> they certainly knew the Seekers. And uh, they at that stage, they hadn't had a hit in uh, Northern America until Georgie Girl. But, of course, they were so well-known in the UK and Europe uh, from, from the get-go, from uh, the carn- carnival is over. <clears throat> and um, there'll never be another you. So, you know, they made the most incredible impression on the world from the time they arrived in London and it was uh, always you you could never be feel jealous or anything because you knew how what a great entity and and a great representation of Australian talent they are. Oh, Normie, well thank you so much for coming on this morning and sharing those beautiful memories and reflections. Have a wonderful day. Okay, I know you're talking to Keith after, and I'd just like to pass on to Keith and the, and the boys, uh, Ethel and Bruce, uh, my condolences. It's a very sad day for them, I'm sure, and uh, um, it certainly is f- for us all. Thanks, Normie. Normie Rowe, Bye-bye. AM, singer, songwriter and actor. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria as we are remembering... Um, a a beautiful singer and storyteller Judith Durham this morning and the Seekers. What's your memory? 1300 222 774 Libby has joined us Hello Libby Hello. What's your memory of Judith Durham? I'm I'm on am I? Yes Um, you're on um, (laughs) (laughs) I just um, I met Judith uh, we did the same secretarial course together. We were both 17 in 1960. Oh. And, uh, Where were you uh, at the time, Libby? We were at, uh, was called Melbourne Technical School then, but it's now RMIT in Bowen Street. Right. What do you remember of Judith at the time? I remember Judith. Um, she, was, uh, she was a very friendly, lovely girl and just... Um, uh, just a, just a genuinely nice person. She was the sort of person that do, she would never say anything nasty about anybody. She was just beautiful. And I'm really sad to hear that you know she's gone. It's really affected me. But um, she, we had a concert. I remember we had a concert there, and uh, I can remember Judith playing the piano, and she was a magnificent piano player. Mm. She was really really talented. And uh, then I know after we graduated from or we finished our course that she went to the advertising company, which is where she met Athol. Yes. And um, then they they uh, actually got a gig on a ship going to England. And that's how they started off. And in those days, that used to be what we used to do. We all used to head over to England and go and do the big um, tour of England um, and head off on a boat. So, um, and I followed her career with much interest and 
she was just such a lovely person. She deserved everything she got. But I'm just so sad to hear that she suffered from such poor health later on in her life. And um, and I'm very upset. And, and listening to her songs now, I get quite teary. <laughs> Libby, did you hear her sing when you were together at the Melbourne Technical College? Yes. And what were your what was your impression hearing her sing at the time? Never forget it. Mm. She had she she was just. And she had a unique voice and just a clear diction and just um, just really talented. So, um, yes, yeah, so I, I will never forget Judy. So, um, bon voyage, Judy and Judith. And um, I just hope that um, she's um, in a better place. She's obviously suffered for a few years. Well, thank you, Libby, for uh, coming on our show and for sharing your memories this morning. Libby there from Newborough, and uh, she studied with Judith at the Melbourne Technical College. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. What are your memories of Judith Durham? 1300 222 774. Julia Zamiro is with us. Hello, Julia. Hello, lovely Lisa. How are you? I'm okay. Uh, you have yeah. a specific memory of Judith when she came on yeah. Rockwiz. Yeah, so uh, we'd been doing Rockwiz for a couple of years and I was sort of still new to working in Melbourne and Rockwiz decided to do this fantastic live show. It was our first live show in front of a huge audience, oh. you know, out of the SB and not in front of just 200. It was uh, at the bowl. Wow. And we wanted to we wanted to celebrate all the artists that had sung at the at the bowl. And so, you know, it went from getting we had Adelita do some <laughs> do rock and roll like noise pollution, Kutch Edwards doing Treaty, Jeff Duff doing wow. Dancing Queen, celebrating these amazing artists. And then at the end, the dream was, could we get Judith Durham to sing there again? Because the Seekers actually did a huge concert at the Bowl in front of 200,000 people. What? I mean, 200,000? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? So you're, you're looking at them at the Bowl and 200,000 wow. people turned up on the 12th of March in 1967. That's one-tenth of the city's entire population at the time. Wow. So we thought at the end of the show when we had this kind of big group number, the lights went down, the audience kind of cleared, uh, the singers cleared the stage and the band stayed there and Judith just came out on her own. Now, I don't think I understood Melburnians enough and their love for her mm -hmm. and maybe the memories of being there but with this gentle breeze blowing, she had this dress on that kind of billowed and that voice that just cut through right up to the back of that um, space. People were so moved and in tears and you could see that it brought back memories that people were kind of a little bit taken aback by. Like Dave Faulkner from the Hoodoo Gurus was there that night and just going, what is this magic? She was kind of, she was kind of magical in how she was able to put emotion into her voice. And um, we were so, so lucky to have that opportunity to see her do that song. And I've seen a few people tweet in the last couple of days before I put up my post about, oh, did anyone ever see us sing that time at the bowl? And it was a surprise move. And um, We've got a little bit magical. of a clip, actually, oh. a little bit of audio that will take us all back. But tell me about what you were feeling at the time. Well, for me, I, I like I say, I was I'd lived in Victoria before, but I really had a Melbourne moment that night. You know, this is a girl um, who was uh, born in uh, Essendon, I think that's correct. Yes, in, in Essendon, and she, I don't know, I felt so much love from all the <laughs> people watching from her, and she was an absolute delight backstage, of course, beautiful. But she was a big secret. We were trying to hide her and go. Let's make, not, we, we're not going to announce it here. <laughs> and, you know, when you don't know if the moment's going to work, and that's what theatre and musicality is about too, you know, showbiz is you hope these moments will work. But the power of who she is, the power of the Seekers, and knowing that 200,000 Melbournians, Victorians, had turned up in 1967 to hear them sing. And here she was again singing, of course, the carnival is over. And here it even is. even more poignant today, yeah. I vow the dawn is waking and my tears are falling rain for the carnival is over we may never meet again 
Julia, how do you feel listening to that? That was the live oh, recording. Yeah, I mean, and can you hear how strong, how beautiful her voice is? It's it was, incredible. It was, yeah, I know. It was a very unique voice. And look, you know, Daniel Johns today posted uh, a beautiful um, tweet about Judith saying she's the only other musician we've ever had sing on one of our records and, and really celebrated her um, as being one of the first, you know, to break through and, and, and have a, a top 10 hit in England with the Seekers. A very special woman and, you know, just worked so hard in her craft, was an ambassador for so many things, especially for motor neuron disease because her husband died from that. And I, I, I'm really thinking of her family and her friends today and, and I hope they know that there's, as you can hear, all the people that are ringing in with their beautiful memories that she's being really remembered today and, yeah. and that music will be timeless. Yeah. As a whole person. And Nola from Pasco Vale has called in on one three hundred triple two seven seven four to join us, Julia, um, because Hi, she's Nola. a big Seekers fan. Nola, she? you tried to go to the 1967 <laughs> performance at the Bowl, but what happened, Nola? Oh. Well, there were so many people there, about mm. 200,000, I think, and mm. we had three young children, and they wouldn't have been able to see anything. So we went home and watched it on television. <laughs> <laughs> and it must have been incredible to see that many people. Did you even oh. attempt to get close, Nola, and then did you just turn around? You couldn't, you couldn't have got close. Yeah. No, there were to- so many people there. It was amazing, about 200,000, I think. And what was it like to watch on the television, Nola? Very good, yes. yes Which is your favourite song? Train whistle blowing. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, blowing down the track. Yeah, yeah. Your beautiful memory. Thank you, Nola, from Pasco I mean, the- Vale. The advantage of television, too, is that she would have got the close-ups and been able to see, you know, Judith's expression and the boys playing and um, there's that. But being on that space, and it was in full sun, like it wasn't an evening gig, it was full oh. sun, so you see everybody sitting there just <laughs> baking in the sun. <laughs> but, um, That's very Melbourne. It's like, yes, oh, the sun's yeah. out and we'll just be boiling. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful yeah. memories there. Well, thank you so much, Julia, for popping in on the show. A pleasure, Lisa, and this is such a beautiful listen this morning, so thank you. Thank you, Julia Zamiro, Rockwiz host and home delivery host as well. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne. You're with Lisa Leong, asking for your memories on 1300 222 774. Graham from Bendigo. Hello, Graham. G'day, Lisa. How are you? G'day. I'm okay. You're a fan of the Seekers as well? I, I'm a big fan of the Seekers, and I was. Uh had the wonderful experience one day as I was leaving school near the shrine, wandering over, as I did, never did, I never walked, I walked to Flinders Street Station. Don't know why. Right. I got to my music bowl and there was the pre-concert rehearsal <gasps> of the, on that day when they put the, like, the whole place would have been packed. What was I? I was an audience of one for three hours. So you sat yeah. there? <laughs> I, I sat hours. there. And took in the, the there were rehearsals and rehearsals and the whole bit for three hours. That's a very long rehearsal, isn't it? It's more than a sound check. Did they go through the whole uh, set? Well, they went through. I mean, I I just know I got home and where were I? Been? Mum said, "Where have I been? You're late for dinner." So I would left school. <laughs> one of the time. I don't know why. Hang I on, went, you were at I'd school. Left, I, was, I was I was at school. I was a little grammar, walking to Flinders Street Station. Right. Don't know why I walked. <laughs> It was early. It wasn't three o'clock. It would have been sort of two o'clock. I don't know what had happened. Yeah, but you back, knew of the Seekers. Uh, you knew, knew what you were experiencing. I knew what I was experiencing. Well, they were the talk of the town. They were what you listened to. And I just sat there in awe. And there they are. They're doing sound checks. They're doing this. They're doing that. Getting speakers in the right. Everything. Because the speakers weren't the size they are today. It's, I mean, I went to the Beatles. You saw the Beatles, the size of the Beatles speakers. They were <laughs> 10 by 10s. Yes. So, you know, the speakers weren't, the setup wasn't what it is today. They had to get everything in position to make sure the sound was going to travel. And then they were moving things around and rehearsing and doing lots of stuff. And I, was, I, I don't know how long I was there. I just sat in awe and listened to the music for, till um, I said, it's late, I better go home. 
And did you tell everyone at school when you went back that you actually saw the Seekers in concert? I probably did at the time. You would have been very popular. Well, I would have been, yeah, but it was, yeah, yeah, but you didn't necessarily, I suppose I did. I mean, I'm looking back, it's a long time ago, I'll give you the nod. Oh, Graham. There I was, 15, 16, 17. What a memory. I'm 74, I'm 74, and there I went to the Beatles concerts, I went to see Bob Dylan's concert. And there was another one that I saw, but I didn't go to the concert. I went to the <laughs> free concert. What a memory. Graham from Bendigo, thank you for calling in. We're um, taking your calls on 1300 222 774. Colleen is with us. Hello, Colleen. Oh, good morning, Lisa. Good morning. Lisa, I remember Judith Durham from, I think, the time before she joined the Seekers. Oh. Now, I grew up in West Brunswick, and I even got a text from my oldest friend last night. We went to see a little club on the corner of Moreland Road and Coonan's Road called the Penville Club above the garage, so it was tiny, and we were blown away by this amazing singer. I had never seen a woman so beautiful who sang so beautifully, and I believe it was before the time she became a, a join the Seekers, and I wonder if anybody else remembers anything from those days. So does anyone remember, can they confirm Colleen's memory? Colleen has called in, she's from East Keylor, uh, to say that she um, heard Judith Durham sing before the Seekers. Um, does anyone else um, remember that time as well on 0437 774 774 or you can call us on 1300 222 774. Thank you, Colleen. Keith Podgar is a founding member of the Seekers. He joins us this morning. Good morning, Keith. Good morning, Lisa, and uh, it's lovely to talk to you again after such a long time. Yes. Um, mm. I think the last time I spoke to you, I was in South Australia and I was presenting right, yeah. the yeah. <laughs> breakfast show in Port Lincoln. Um, Port Lincoln, I remember it well. Um, how are you feeling, Keith? Oh, feeling up and down, let's mm. put it that way. Uh, um, I've... Um, I've had uh, I've had some up periods remembering uh, remarkable moments with Judith, but then uh, I just had those uh, down moments to think that um, uh, that uh, she is uh, no longer with us. But uh, no, uh, I'm I'm fine. I'm, I'm just uh, full of full of uh, recollections, and and they're, they're all fantastic recollections, as it turns out. And what memories are coming up for you, Keith? Well, uh, they go right back to that first time that uh, that, that I met Judith in uh, uh, in 1962 when she came to sing with Ethel and Bruce and me at uh, the Treble Cliff in South Yarra. Uh, and uh, they just stretch on from there. Really, we had uh, uh, we had a remarkable uh, connection in concerts and uh, and in um, uh, recording studios and and photo sessions and uh, and also uh, on social occasions as well you know i visited <laughs> uh, i was just it just covers all the uh, all, all all the ranges of uh, of contact that one could have and they're all uh, all the recollections are fantastic Normie Rose spoke of that incredible connection that you had as a foursome can you describe that for us well, uh, the nearest I can um, uh, describe it to, I suppose, or the nearest comparison would be that we were a family and um, we were like siblings. Uh, I regard Ethel as my older brother and Bruce as my younger brother and Judith as my, my little sister. It's, it's really quite, quite extraordinary how, uh, how that uh, bond uh, developed uh, so quickly and, and so strongly. It was just, uh, it was just quite amazing. And what was it like um, thinking back to when suddenly the Seekers were dominating the UK charts and then becoming number one in the US? What was that like for your relationships? Well, it was fantastic for our, uh, uh, our feelings between, between each other because we felt that we were sharing the whole ride, if you like, um, together. And um, and that, that was that was one of the uh, remarkable things about about how we dealt with that uh, that amount of success. And of course, full tribute should be paid to Tom Springfield, who who guided that by um, first of all writing some fantastic songs, and second of all, uh, 
uh, producing them and uh, all those singles and, and our early uh, LPs, our albums in those days. So uh, it was like a like a five part group, uh, I guess. That was uh, that was one of the one of the best things about it. And often the particular song Georgie Girl um, has been connected with Judith and I guess her um, body images and the way she sort of saw herself. Um, what are your reflections on Judith as a person? Well, my reflection on Judith as a person, she was, she was strong, uh, she was um, heroic, she was like giving, uh, she involved uh, in herself in lots of uh, charitable uh, activities, and uh, I guess you know, quite apart from having that um, that extraordinary voice, that unique voice, um, she was she was a very giving giving person. So that's my overriding um, mm. uh, impression of her. Yeah, that's beautiful, and, and a lot of people ringing in about her generosity of spirit as well. Um, is there a moment that comes to mind when there was an example of that beautiful generosity of spirit? Well, it really revolves, I think, around the fact that um, her husband, uh, Ron Edgeworth, uh, died of motor neuron uh, disease, and uh, and the way she uh, embraced uh, that particular charity was just an inspiration to all of us. And uh, it, uh, as far as I can tell, it made uh, quite a difference to the awareness of that uh, that particular uh, issue and uh, to see her uh, unfailingly help to uh, to raise funds and as we all did I suppose through our through our concerts and uh, that, that was that was quite remarkable in her in her generosity of, of spirit and uh, you spoke of her charity um, work um, in relation to motor neuron disease and, and the fact that she was also uh, honoured not only uh, with an Order of Australia in 2014, but uh, she was inducted into the Australian Women in Music Awards in 2019. Um, how would you like her to best be remembered, Keith? Well, uh, remembered as a, as a fine person. Uh, who also happened to uh, have uh, a unique voice and uh, and also uh, happened to be my uh, little sister in in uh, in many ways so uh, i i just uh, hope that uh, her her legacy and her uh, her memory will be an inspiration to to lots of other uh, people who aspire to be uh, as um, as good as uh, as Judith uh, was. And people are nominating their favourite Seekers song. What's yours, Keith? Mine has always been "The Carnival Is Over," and it's uh, it's just uh, it encapsulates for me, I suppose, her her extraordinary voice and uh, and uh, and a fantastic melody that uh, that Tom Springfield used uh, to create that particular song, and so. Uh, you know, it was a, just a great thrill for us to record that song, which was uh, which became a number one in uh, in 1965, and uh, and it's actually in still in the top uh, 30, I believe, of, um, of all time best-selling singles in the UK. So it, that's uh, that song in itself is a is a remarkable legacy, but it um, it does show off <laughs> that wonderful, that incredible voice that that she uh, that Judith Durham had. And Keith, um, people also recalling that incredible uh, My Music Bowl um, performance to 200,000 people. What was that like for you? For me, it was uh, uh, absolutely an awesome um, experience to, for us all to, to walk out on the stage. It's been a very warm day and uh, to walk out on the stage and see the, the heat shimmering off those people. <laughs> In the audience, it was quite fantastic. And then we had this enormous orchestra and a huge choir behind us. Wow. And uh, we, oh goodness gracious, it was it was just fantastic and uh, absolutely one of the highlights of our career. Well, thank you so much, Keith, for sharing memories um, with us this morning. And thank you, Lisa. 
and speak again soon. That's Keith Podka, founding member of The Seekers. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria as we remember Judith Durham from The Seekers taking your calls on 1300 222 774. Billy from Flowerdale. Good morning, Billy. Good morning. Yeah, um, I just wanted to go more about her community spirit. Uh, in in the eighties the nurses strike was on and they had a fundraiser and she volunteered to uh sing for the fundraiser, which was great. And um she also uh, had a had a connection with Victorian Aboriginals singing singing with Kutcher Edwards the national anthem with uh words to include the uh you know Reconciliation and to include the uh, Aboriginals in in that song. Yeah, I'm just getting so many beautiful stories of her incredible community spirit, as you're saying. But this way of connecting with others. Thank you so much, Billy from Flowerdale, and Daryl from Dadswell Bridge joins us. Hello, Daryl. Good morning, Dad. Um, yes, memories of Judith Durham. Um, I grew up in the um. 60s, of course, with um, the, when the Seekers are just hitting their fame. In the 90s, Judith come up and did a do in Horsham. And she was showing her skill playing keyboard to piano, not just a fantastic, one of the best singers in the world. And when she was playing the gig, the microphone fell off the <laughs> keyboard to piano onto the floor. Right. And she kept playing. And when she finished, just at that particular stage, some pop singer of the 90s had been caught miming the words to a song. Oh, yes, I remember that. Good, OK. And it was just before Judith came up to Horsham. <laughs> and um, then so she made a bit of a joke about it. I had to keep playing. Yes, she would have thought I was, I was miming it, basically, <laughs> there. So, um, Excellent. Yeah. Loved so... everything. Um, um, the singer, the Seekers did. I don't like Georgie Girl to this day. I love everything else they sing, oh. in a personal opinion. I must make a memory of Frank Trainer's jazz band, who Judith's cut her teeth with. Frank came up to Horsham a couple of times in the 70s. Remember you, Frank. Um, Eris Gay, Love, Lil Plaza, Dear Moore, were as good as any of their most famous hits with full orchestral backing there. Just wanted to say, um, yeah, how much I love to see because a little memory of Judith personally there. Thank you so much, Daryl. Uh, Daryl calling in on one three hundred triple two seven seven four. What are your memories? You can give us a call. Uh, Di from Bulleen. Hello, Di. Oh, hello, Lisa. How are you? I'm okay. You saw Judith playing in the 60s. Yeah, back in the 60s, we were supposed to be studying French and uh, <laughs> snuck out from our parents who were off on a drive. So my girlfriends and I shot into a place called Purple Eye, which was a little basement jazz club opposite the town hall down... I, I, know, I forget that. I think it's Capital Arcade, but I'm not sure. And Judith was singing... I think it was the John Hawes jazz band. I don't think it was Frank Trainer, But at those days, we were jazzers. So we were following Judy Jarks and the Yarrow jazz band and, and also a John Hawes Purple Eye. So was this just before the Seekers? All... Pardon? This was before the she was in the oh, Seekers. Well before and... the Seekers, yeah. No. I was about sixteen, I reckon, and I'm seventy five now, so she would have been about twenty, nineteen or twenty, I think. Um singing yeah, singing down there in the basement. So it was yeah, quite interesting. And did you know her and spot her as talent in those days, Di? No, look, back in those days, I was just too busy, you know, sneaking out of home and going to jazz dances. I, I didn't, um, I, I probably enjoyed her voice and I just loved jazz music at the time, so I really wasn't focused on Judith, but certainly have appreciated her since then and, uh, yeah, sing some of her songs. I belong to a choir called Sisters and Misters <laughs> and um, it's run by Irene Bennett's and it's a fabulous choir with a whole lot of women and blokes and and we do sing The Carnival is Over, which is my Really? Yeah, so is it hard uh, to sing? Seems like it would be I quite a you, difficult one. I can't one. reach Judith's note. Yeah. Uh, Irene <laughs> takes it down for the rest of us because we couldn't. And, and much as I play her number here, I cannot reach her notes. I can't keep up with her. I've got to... Yeah, you've got to bring it down. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you so much, Di from Berlin. And uh, taking your calls on one three hundred triple two seven seven four. Chris, good morning. Chris from Officer. Good morning, Julia. How are you? Hello. You saw Judith playing at a jazz festival. It was the Australian Jazz Convention at the Q Town Hall. And there was one hall that had... Judith Durham, I'm pretty sure she was singing with a band called the Graveside Six, and she was in one hall singing hot gospel, 
And in the other hall was Judy Jacks with the Yarra Yarra New Orleans Jazz Band singing hot gospel. And people were just going from one room to the other. <laughs> they were competing for the audience. It was incredible. And what do you remember of Judith's voice, Chris? Fantastic. I mean, she could sing hot gospel and uh, then, as you know, with the Seekers singing yeah. all the folk melodies, folky yeah. sort of by crikey, she could belt out hot gospel. <laughs> Chris from Officer sharing his memories there. Diana, hello. You had an encounter with Judith, I hear. Oh, you're breaking up, Diana. Are you there? I'd love to hear about your... Diana? Answer. Yes. Diana? Yes, hi. Yes, hi. I was a ballet student um, at my late husband's ballet studio, Paul Hammond, in... Um, in Little Trove Street in the city, and Judith came and played for us several times, uh, the ballet classes for the ballet as a pianist. Oh. Yes. And, and that was before she um, joined the Seekers, um, and she was just beautiful to us. Um, we were just a, two or three years younger than her, uh -huh. and um, very much, um, she was lovely, but she played ballet music beautifully for the classes, so... I remember her that way and love her music, um, just love her songs. They're just so gorgeous and what a voice as we all know, as we all remember. So I just wanted to say that because nothing had been mentioned about her playing for ballet. Yes. So a memory there about Judith Durham playing piano, accompanying the ballet. Eddie from Malvern joins us as well. Hello, Eddie. Oh, good morning to you. Good morning. <laughs> When I heard, uh, you know, Judith passed away, I really got Judith because, you know, she kind of an angel to, you know, to go so young. She is my age. Now, the first time I've seen her, I was on holiday. I, um, Where were you? I, I was in Copenhagen. In Copenhagen? Uh, yes, wow. but I'm from Israel and I couldn't speak English at all. And um, anyway, we went to see the show at the Tivoli, and I tell you what, her voice, her voice, it's an angel. Yeah. And I'm talking to you, and I'm so, you know, upset. Oh, Eddie. You know, she's a, a lovely, lovely person, beautiful songs. Anywhere she went, and... But I did not even dream to come to Australia. Now I'm, you know, 70. I came to Australia in 66 and I'm still here. And every day I went to see her at the ball. Anytime I could see, see them or listen to them, I got the records. I bought the record in Tivoli the first day, the first time. And I couldn't understand what they're singing. <laughs> you know, but to me now I understand the, in, in, I understand the English, the words and the songs. What the, it touch your heart. And it beautiful. sounds like you're a beautiful connection to Judith, to the yeah. Seekers and to Australia there, yeah, Eddie, yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I love, well, I'm now Freddy Gamozi more an, an Israeli. And um, it's such beautiful. And unfortunately now I'm, I'm just, you know, getting out of the hospital after eight days. And uh, I feel better, but I'm so sorry to hear that. I wish I wish she's in a better place. Thank you, Eddie. Thanks for sharing your memories this morning. Eddie from Malvern there on one three hundred triple two seven seven four, And we will um, keep on taking your calls this morning as we remember Judith Durham on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. People were trying to evade detection. Dale's called from Fish Creek. I ended up three years without no one knowing where I was. I didn't want anyone to find me. Wow. Did your family find you? Yeah, my sister put posters everywhere and someone spotted me in Cranbourne walking my dog. Raph Epstein. If someone was yeah. thinking about doing that, what would you say to them? Just make the phone call. Just ring someone in your family. They'll help you at any time, I promise you. I love you. Raph Epstein. Weekdays from 3.30 on ABC Radio Melbourne. You're with Lisa Leon. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774.
Taking your memories on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria, we're remembering Judith Durham. Uh, text through on 0437 774 774. My dad was doing rehab after a hip operation. One of the other participants was sitting at a piano one day, playing and singing. I don't know how he didn't recognise her because he was a huge fan. But my dad kindly went over and told the fellow patient that she had a wonderful voice and had she ever thought of becoming a professional singer. (laughs) The singer gave him a sweet smile and thanked him for his kind words. Dad was both mortified and gratified to realise shortly after that it was Judy Derham doing rehab after a car accident. Dad had listened to the Seekers so much uh, and I had listened to all the words of their songs. Oh, thank you for that memory on 0437 774 774. As we take your calls on 1300 222 774, Barry has joined us from Cobram. G'day, Barry. Oh, good morning. Good morning. Well, what's your memory of Judith? Um, I was similar to uh, Di from Bulleen that spoke earlier. I remember <laughs> seeing jazz at the Purple Eye with the John Norris Jazz Band too um, and, uh, on Sunday afternoons. Um, and I first encountered her at a little jazz dance in Mooney Ponds. It was called Jazz Junction. When she, where she also used to sing with, with John Hawes. I've actually got a John Hawes LP still, I think, somewhere, but they were great memories. And uh, she certainly could belt out that jazz. Yeah. And uh, very sad to hear of her passing. Did you have a favourite song, Barry? Um, I can't remember anything at the moment. It was a long time ago, but uh, I'll have to dig that LP out and see if she's uh, actually on there. Um, she could have been on there with them. But, uh, yeah, great memories. And Jane has texted through on 0437 774 774. In their early days, did the Seekers ever perform at Q Town Hall? Barry, can you help us with this question? No, the, um, the times Di and I are speaking about are well before the Seekers in the no. very early 60s. Yeah, probably around 62, I'd say. So if anyone can help us out, Jane has texted, did the Seekers ever perform at Q-Town Hall? If you attended that, one three hundred triple two seven seven four. 774 we would love to hear from you. Julia from Buxton has called through. Hello, Julia. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> yes, I, I remember, Judith, when we were at school, we used to have um, morning assemblies and every now and then we'd have a musical performance and Judy, as she was Judy Cock at that stage, oh, yes. she took her mother's. She took her mother's name, Durham later, her mother's maiden name, and she was playing Green Door, the Frank Frankie Vaughan song, and she was belting it out <laughs> on the piano, and it was so amazing for a fairly conventional school <laughs> to have this girl at the piano, belting out and singing, and <laughs> she was. Oh, it's a childhood memory that I'll never forget. And um, I just want to know, because she's quite diminutive, so was she quite small but then just had this massive yes. voice, Julia? Yes, she was. She was. <laughs> that would have been a in, sight to behold. There she was in, in her school uniform, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. And was this in Essendon the, or was this somewhere no, else? this was in Kew. She went in to Wright Girl School in right. Kew. And we used to sit in the, our little assembly hall was at the gym too. It was very small school in those days. And we'd sit on the floor for assembly. So <laughs> oh, wow. Things have changed a bit since then. That's incredible. And so did you tell everyone that you went to school with uh, Judith Durham when they became <laughs> massive oh, as the Seekers? No. <laughs> oh, I used to tell the Green Door story, but that's about all. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning, Julia. Julia from Buxton there. And Julie from Phillip Island. Good morning, Julie. Oh. Hello. How are you? Good. Um, I'm just ringing about Judith singing down here, I think it was probably a one-off a holiday time in 1961, I'm fairly sure. She sang at what was the old post office um, building that was a coffee lounge sort of jazz place. And uh, I remember her coming and her it was only a three-piece. She, I think she might have played the piano, I don't know, but her voice carried out across the foreshore. It's right on the corner of the Esplanade. 
and people came up from the beach. It was such a stunning voice. And uh, they just stood along the front there in the esplanade and up the side of the old post office building uh, because this voice was so strong, so clear, and sort of a bit ethereal. You know, it had a quality about it that was qu- quite a knockout, really. And I remember thinking, I was there with some young friends, and I remember thinking, this girl's got a knockout voice. She's going places. You know, so she certainly was. There you go, but, Julie. Uh, but that was, you know, she stopped, she kind of stopped the passing traffic with this uh, clear voice. I'm trying to think of the numbers she sang. It might have been the green door she ended up with on that night. And I think she sang a few jazz songs too, like uh, Stars Fell on Alabama. And maybe one of the lovely songs, I think, I might be wrong on this, was Bewitched, Bothered and Bewildered. And I think, you know, that was just lovely, you know, just lovely. I never heard her sing that again, but at the time it was probably right for the jazz club, I suppose. Julie, thank you so much for sharing your memories. That's Julie from Phillip Island. And as promised, The Seekers, Georgie Girl, on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria, as we remember Judith Durham. Lisa Leong with you. Fancy free, nobody you meet could ever see the loneliness there inside you. Hey there, Georgie girl, why do all the boys just pass you by? Could it be you just don't try, or is it the clothes you wear? You're always window shopping, but never stopping to buy. So shed those dowdy feathers and Another Georgie deep inside Bring out all the love you hide And oh what a change there'd be The world would see A new Georgie girl a reality you can't always run away don't be so scared of changing and rearranging yourself it's time for jumping down from the shell a little bit hey there georgie girl there's another georgie deep inside bring out all the love you hide and oh what a change there'd be The Seekers, Georgie Girl, as we remember Judith Durham, who passed away on Friday night. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Lisa Leong with you, taking your calls with memories on three uh, one three hundred triple two seven seven four and texts on 0437 774 774. Marianne from Geelong, you write condolences to the Seekers. Wonderful Judith, Judith Durham, part of our lives growing up, loving memories of my mother singing me to sleep with Morning Town Ride. We love dancing and singing to Georgie Girl. Di writes, I'm so sad to hear of Judith's, Judith's passing. One of my favourite songs that the Seekers performed is Put a Dream in Your Pocket, May She Rest in Peace. And another one here, this one from Jill. I remember sneaking out religiously to go to Basin Street in Brighton very early 60s and seeing her with Frank Trainer. great days. Always loved her voice 
And Judy Jux certainly sang at the Q Civic Centre with the Yarra Yarra Jazz Band, but I'm not sure about Judy Durham and whether she was there. We're trying to confirm whether or not she was there. And Jenny from Heidelberg. I was there uh, in the 1960s at the bowl listening so many people because there wasn't a fence. It's news time, ABC. ABC News with Mary McDonald. Good morning. Investigations are underway into the death of a man in police custody in Melbourne's north this morning. Yvette Gray reports. Police were called to Murphy Street in Preston around four o'clock this morning following reports a car had crashed through a fence and into the front yard of a home. Police say a man inside the car was agitated and acting erratically when he confronted officers at the scene. Police attempted to restrain the man before he appeared to become unresponsive. The officers called for medical assistance and performed CPR, but the man couldn't be revived. Detectives from the Homicide Squad will investigate the incident with oversight from the professional Standards Command, which is standard practice when there's a death in police custody. The federal government is describing China's decision to conduct large-scale military exercises around Taiwan as an overreaction to a recent visit from US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Australia, the United States and Japan are among countries condemning Beijing's actions, which have included firing ballistic missiles over the island in a clear show of military force. China's embassy in Australia has accused the three countries of finger-pointing and argues it's China which is the victim of ongoing US provocation. Frontbencher Annika Wells has told Sky News, Beijing's actions are concerning. We feel that the response by the Chinese government was disproportionate and destabilising and that now remains a watching brief for Minister Wong, obviously, to make sure that we're doing everything we can to stabilise security in the region. The state government is defending its decision not to provide compensation to Victorians who were trapped in New South Wales when the border was closed last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Ombudsman Deborah Glass described the management of some cases as inhumane and unjust and recommended in her report to provide compensation to help cover the financial cost of not being able to travel home. However, Victoria's Health Department has responded on its website that it's not considering making ex gratia payments to those Victorians who were impacted. Senior Government Minister Lily D'Ambrosio says the border closure was needed to protect lives. We know, of course, that there were a number of Victorians who were quite distressed by that lockdown. But the reality is this, the government made the decision that we had to in order to save lives at a time when vaccination levels were at 17%. Another three Victorians have died after contracting COVID-19. The number of people in hospital with the virus now sits at 660. Of those patients, 40 are in intensive care units and 11 are on ventilators. There were 5,114 new cases officially reported to the health department, although authorities believe the true number is much higher. Australian singer Judith Durham is being remembered as a singer who showed others how to succeed. Durham has died in Melbourne after suffering complications from chronic lung disease. She was 79. She was the lead singer of The Seekers, Australia's first international supergroup, which topped the charts in the UK and US in the 1960s. Her bandmates took to social media to say her struggle was intense and heroic, never complaining of her destiny and fully accepting its conclusion. Her long-time manager, Graeme Simpson, says she's set the template for those who want to follow. Young Australians who are looking to have a career in music can look to her as an example and realise that you don't have to go down the drug path, you don't have to be controversial, you just have to be talented and do what you do. Israel says it will continue to stand up to terrorist organisations as cross-border clashes continue into a second day. The Israeli military is targeting members of the Islamic Jihad group in response to an estimated 300 Palestinian rockets and mortars being fired since Friday. The Palestinian Territory's health ministry says 24 people have been killed in the Gaza Strip, including six children. But Israeli government spokesperson Kieran Hadjioff says they have video evidence showing Islamic Jihad rockets hitting civilians. There was no Israeli activity in the Gaza Strip, in that area or at that time. Islamic Jihad is killing Palestinian children in Gaza. One in four rockets fired from Gaza towards Israel lands inside the Gaza Strip. 
To the weather now for the state, a dry and partly cloudy day in the far northwest, mostly cloudy elsewhere with isolated showers tending scattered about Gippsland and the eastern ranges, showers falling as snow above 1,000 metres. For Melbourne, partly cloudy, the high chance of showers about the Dandenongs with a medium chance elsewhere with a top today of 14 degrees. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, 13. Tuesday, becoming sunny, 13 again. Wednesday, cloud increasing and 16. Right now in Melbourne, it's 11 degrees. ABC News. On ABC Radio Melbourne and ABC Victoria, you're with Lisa Leong. Well, we've been taking your stories on 1300 222 774 about Judith Durham. We've heard about you going to school with Judith and hearing her sing in the school hall as you were seeing cross-legged on the floor. We then heard about Melbourne Tech School where she was training to be a secretary and, and then she joined an advertising company and then met uh, the future seekers as they formed and then you've taken us to the Maya Music Bowl with 200,000 people as you were trying to get in and not being able to get in and then watching her on the TV. Please keep those memories coming in, one three hundred triple two seven seven four, 774 or you can text on 0437 774 774 as we remember Judith Durham. A text here, I worked with Judith at J. Walter Thompson, 1966. She was secretary to JWT's research director, Frank Heatherton. A wonderful and kind person. Her last appearance was several days before they departed on the ship for a free concert on the forecourt of the Southern Cross Hotel. I attended, I wished her well, and hopefully success. What an understated wish for such a huge outcome. Thank you so much for that memory, Alan there texting through on 0437 774 774 or call in 1300 222 774 now we're going to cross now to the weather bureau and matthew thomas is there to give us an update on the weather hello matthew hello how are you good um very interesting weather so i was out on friday and i was just started playing you know a bit of tennis and then i got completely drenched <laughs> i wasn't paying attention so i want to pay attention now what's been happening with our weather is it going to continue well, raining i think it's going to be nice for the next couple of days it will um clear up for the the next few days apart from really um east gippsland and um and the northeast um, tomorrow might just see um, a few showers as well. Um, we might see, likely to see some um, isolated showers just pop up during the afternoon um, over um, parts of the state. There won't really be terribly much in that. Um, you'll probably be a bit unlucky if you were out playing tennis and, um, and got caught <laughs> under a, a shower um, today. But um, look, there will be um, some afternoon showers just popping up um, through a, a number of districts, but the showers will, are more frequent um, at the moment about Gippsland, mm -hmm. um, with a trough just lying back along the, the Gippsland coast and just bringing that level of instability um, to the air and just um, helping the, the development of the shower activity through um, through Gippsland. And um, we're also likely to see scattered showers um, pop up just in the um, in the um, northeast as well, um, but. We will see a high pressure system approach from the um, the west into tomorrow, um, and the showers will contract back to Gippsland and the the northeast for tomorrow. Um, and the rainfall amounts um, will decrease. So rather than the sort of two to ten millimetres that we'll see around Gippsland and the the northeast today, it'll be closer to one to five millimetres. Right. Um, that high pressure system, though, as it moves over the state, will bring a cold start, particularly about the west and the north of the state um, tomorrow morning. And so I'm likely to issue a frost warning um, just sort of with um, temperatures getting down below one degree um, about parts of the, the west and the, the north and possibly also about um, the central and northern central um, districts as well. Um, but the colder days will be on Tuesday and Wednesday mornings with that high pressure system sitting, um, sitting over um, the state and just slowly moving east 
into um, into Wednesday. So very cold starts, but look largely dry days um, um, through um, Tuesday and Wednesday until some showers start to push into the west late on Wednesday, and that's ahead of another. Um, low pressure system that will approach um, Victoria from the west during Thursday and um, and Friday, and we'll see that um, those showers begin to extend over the state um, on on Thursday and Friday. So unfortunately, some wet weather coming back um, for Thursday, Friday, and um, and Saturday. Do we have any current warnings or any warnings on the horizon? So the, the main Matthew? warning that we have are the flood warnings for the um, the northeast. So we do have a. a minor flood warning for the Snowy River that will be finalised today. There is also a minor flood warning for the Kiwa and the Murray River um, but there is also one for the Ovens and King River and we're likely to see the Ovens River um, just peak at minor flood um, at Wangaratta this evening at um, around, um, probably around um, 7 or 8 this evening through overnight it should remain at, um, at minor flood level. I'm just looking at the um, the populated centres today. Most centres are going to see temperatures around the um, the 13 to um, to 15 um, degree range, and we've already um, seen a 15 degree um, pop up at um, at um, Phillip Island, so um, which is a, a surprise given the onshore flow mm. um, there. But that's been the warmest place in the state <laughs> um, so far. Wow. Um, but um, yes, as I said, the showers about today um, and tomorrow cooler starts but the, the really cold starts will be Tuesday and Wednesday Always keeping us on our toes Thank you so much Matthew No worries, have a great day You too, Matthew Thomas, Senior Forecaster at the Weather Bureau You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria it's all Tickets are now available for our Friday review live gig in Nary Warrant packed full of incredible musical guests. We want you to be there along with James Rain Deborah Conway, Wilson, the Halo Vocal Ensemble, Ella Hooper, all performing live. Don't miss the Friday Review live from Bunjil Place, Nary Warren, on Friday, August 26th. Book your tickets at abc.net.au slash Melbourne. You're with Lisa Leon. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774. Sunday, it's sports time and we're going to the Formula One world, which has been shaken because at the centre, three Australian drivers. What has been happening and why? To tell us more, Matt Koch, senior journalist at speedcafe.com. G'day, Matt. G'day, Lisa. Drama. Who are the main players? <laughs> well, hello. I could speak for the rest of the day on this, such has been the drama that's unfolded in the last week or so. At the heart of things, we've got Oscar Piastri, who is Australia's next big hope in the Formula One world. He's a high-potential junior who's won three consecutive championships on the bounce. He's currently the reserve driver at the Alpine Formula One team. Mm -hmm. Across the table from him, we've got Daniel Ricciardo, the established star, eight-time Grand Prix winner at McLaren, who looks as though he's about to lose his job and then waiting in the wings we've got a young Jack Dewan who is I guess Australia's next bright star behind Oscar Piastri he's currently racing in a Formula 1 feeder series that looks as though he's on the path to Formula 1 and might have that uh, accelerated a little bit so it's yeah it's a dramatic little story that's un un unfolding at the moment that involves three Australians and potentially could knock three Australians careers on their heads so what started this all off? What happened uh, with Oscar? So Oscar won a championship three or four years ago, the mm. Formula Renault Championship, that ultimately led to a, a, a scholarship with, with what is now Alpine. That yes. meant he got funding through Formula 2 and Formula 3 and ultimately landed him the drive he's got now. He should be in Formula 1 racing, but there was no seat available, so he became the reserve driver, basically one back from the race drivers waiting in case they get sick or they stub their toe or whatever the case may be. Uh, so he should realistically be in Formula 1, but there was nowhere for him to go. Now, Fernando Alonso and Esteban Ocon are the drivers at the Alpine team. Ocon is on a long-term contract. He's not going anywhere. It also helps that he's French, driving for a French team. Uh, Fernando Alonso is out of contract at the end of this year, and he decided 
blindsiding the entire Formula One world, I must admit. Mm-hmm. On uh, on Monday, he announced that he's leaving Alpine at the end of the year and going to Aston Martin to replace Sebastian Vettel, who's retiring. So suddenly, Alpine has a seat free. Oscar Piastri is and they the had man no to go idea. Into that seat. So Alpine had and, no idea. Absolutely no idea. Uh, the team boss there, Otmar Safnauer, spoke to the media on Tuesday morning, less than 24 hours after Alonso announcing his departure. He said, the first I heard of this was reading Aston Martin's media release on Monday morning. Um, he left the circuit in Hungary on Sunday, where the Hungarian Grand Prix was uh, last weekend, so having had a conversation with Alonso, saying, yep, cool, we'll, we'll sign that new contract in the next couple of days. They thought they had Fernando Alonso signed up, one forward 24 hours, Fernando's left, left the team, one forward another 12 hours, and you've got Otmar Safnauer saying, we had no idea. This has completely caught us off guard. So then Alpine made an announcement about Oscar. Yeah, so shortly after that media conference, uh, the team put out a statement announcing Oscar Piastri as its new driver for 2023. Interestingly, Usually when these announcements get put out, there's a comment from the team principal saying how excited they are and a comment from the driver saying how enthusiastic they are as well to be you know, embarking on this new project together. There were no comments from Oscar whatsoever. He was notably absent from that statement. Hmm. About an hour and three quarters later, that statement came out at about quarter past two on Wednesday morning Australian time or Eastern Standard Time. Wind forward about an hour and three quarters to 4 a.m., Oscar Piastri puts out a statement on social media saying, I had no part to do with that that statement. I was not involved. I am not driving at Alpine oh, next wow. year. And suddenly you've got this, he said, she said. There were whispers of Oscar talking to, to McLaren anyway. Daniel Ricciardo has been under pressure there for quite some time, despite holding a valid contract. Um, so it didn't come as a complete shock. But to see it played out so publicly was was simply extraordinary and not something that's happened in Formula One for a long, long time. And so where is it now? At the moment, it's a little bit up in the air. No one's saying anything. The common logic is that it's currently being decided by what's called the Contract Recognition Board. It's a facility of the FIA, Motorsports World Governing Body, uh, part of the rules of competing in Formula One is that if there are any contract disputes with a driver, the contract recognition board is the, the dispute, you know, they look after that stuff. So they don't go to the Supreme Court or the High Court or anything like that. That is a judicial process, which raises some interesting legal arguments about, you know, restriction of justice and all that sort of stuff. But that body exists and it will decide on who has the valid contract over Oscar Piastri for. 2023. Now, sources there have suggested that McLaren has that contract. Alpine does not. So at the moment, it looks as though Oscar Piastri will drive for McLaren in 2023 and Daniel Ricciardo will be probably significantly wealthier but not driving for McLaren next year. Seems very messy. Is it usually this messy? (laughs) Not usually, um, or if it is, it plays out behind closed doors. And that's what's really remarkable about this, is that we're seeing it all play out in front of us. The the Alpine statement to start with was unusual, and then Oscar had to respond, obviously. McLaren's remained completely silent throughout this, which is probably the, the best thing to do, although that's not helped things on its front, because obviously there's, you know, it's drawn Daniel Ricciardo into this as well. So... It's a really messy situation that comes down to clauses in contracts, subclauses in contracts, timing of when those clauses are activated, recognition and, and the legalese in those clauses. Uh, ultimately, us in the media, we're getting lots of little snippets where we're hitting up all our sources and finding out what we can. But at the moment, it really is a case of best guess. And the best guess is that Oscars at McLaren. Um, we won't know that for a little while. Formula One's in a in a shutdown period for a couple of weeks. I've had 13 races or something already this season, so it's been a hugely busy start to the season. Um, so it's having a little bit of a breather. It'll be a couple of weeks, really, before we see this one fully shake out. 
And do you think there might be more formal structural change as a result of this? Because, you know, dealing with private contracts and uh, he said, she said, as you're saying, uh, it doesn't seem like a very efficient way to move forward and such an important decision. It really is. Interestingly, the Contract Recognition Board is really at the centre of this. That was stood up in 1991 off the back of a similar situation over Michael Schumacher. Uh, so this process was put in place basically to expedite these uh, these sorts of conversations without having to go into the legal realm and you know really slow things down and you know rack up the price for for the team. So the idea is that the FIA is a is an independent arbiter of the sport, has that authority given to it by the, the teams under its commercial rights uh, to do that. Of course, there's all sorts of legal questions that, that that raises, but fundamentally, I don't see the structure changing. The, the process has worked really well for a long time. Uh, there's been a similar situation like this, Jensen Button in 2004, he signed the contract with Williams, even though he had a valid one at another team, BAR Honda. Mm-hmm. Uh, ultimately, even though he signed the contract with Williams, he ended up racing for BAR Honda, and you wow. wind that forward a couple of years. He ended up winning a world championship there. Wow. So, yeah, it's it's an interesting one. It doesn't happen often enough to really merit change, but that has played out so publicly. It really reflects quite poorly on, on Alpine and has been really mismanaged by their public relations team. Well, Matt, keep us up to date and thank you so much for coming on the show this morning. You're welcome. Thank you. Matt Koch, Head of Editorial at SpeedCafe.com. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Lisa Leong with you and another huge Commonwealth Games haul overnight. We have Trent Copeland, who is a cricket player and commentator for Channel 7. Trent, good morning. How are you going? Thanks for staying up for us. Uh, Ollie oh, Hall... No Winning the uh, 1,500 metres, I saw the last 100 metres, oh, it was a heart stopper. Oh, absolutely it was. It was one of those those moments where, and particularly with Bruce McAvaney commentating, <laughs> just one of those moments in time, wasn't it? It was just incredible. Yeah, and I think there were tears, um, <laughs> Ollie and all of us watching it as well. Um, was it unexpected? Uh, I think you could say so, and it's not necessarily to do with Ollie Hall himself. It was more Chariot, who is a Kenyan superstar for so many years, um, the current world champion that he ran down. It was one of those moments where it's like you think to yourself, how on earth can he possibly have the best kick left in him to get over the hump in that last 100 metres? Quite remarkable. He came from, was he about fourth? Or yes, fifth at one yes. stage, and he just, it was like he had that last gear, didn't he? Yeah, exactly right. And that I guess that is what 1500 metre running is all about. But to see him do that against, you know, some of the best in the world, just remarkable. And as I said, could be one of the best moments of the last decade, really, in athletics. Beautiful. Um, And we're speaking with Trent Copeland here. We're talking about the Commonwealth Games, the amazing wins overnight, and the Australian Diamonds won the netball semi-final, defeating the England Roses. Another wonderful result for us. Yeah, absolutely. And after a shock loss to uh, Jamaica in the pool stages, that was our first loss ever. In the history of Commonwealth Games, the first time we'd ever lost a netball match in the pool stages. Yeah. to bounce back and win so clinically against England, who were going really well. Um, and they beat us at Gold Coast 2018 for the gold medal as well. Uh, that was a big win. So we take on Jamaica again tonight in the gold medal game. So that and uh, I tell you what, tonight's lineup. I don't know if you've seen it, but it, it is just unbelievable. We've got both beach volleyball teams in the gold medals. We've got Peter Bowl running in the morning in the 800. Uh, and obviously the women's hockey final with the, the hockey ruse. So, uh, and, and I'm sure I've missed about 10 other events. So it's just unreal. Well, we're going to have to talk about the cricket with you, Trent, <laughs> being a cricket player yourself. <laughs> sure. So women's T20 semi-final win against New Zealand. That was a huge win. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I mean, they, I don't think the Aussies have played their best cricket either to get to this point, which is saying something about how dominant they are in the world of cricket. But... Um, Look, last night was a game where New Zealand put us under the pump a few times. Mm. Sophie Devine, the opposition skipper, is just an absolute superstar. Um, and, and you think about our best players, 
none of our you know top order really fired again with the bat. So I feel like I, it was a real I'm... team result though. So everyone sort of did their work, yes. and Leah took us home with her bowling as well. Yes, exactly right. And I think the um, you know the batting with Ash Gardner finishing off a couple of these games with a really level head. You know, it's not something you really associate with Ash Gardner. It's more the explosiveness, <laughs> the sixes, um, you know, the flash and flare. So um, I think this team is just growing leaps and bounds. And I mentioned they haven't been at their best potentially, but, you know, the big moments, think back to the MCG, that T20 World Cup final. It's going to be a rematch of that. And I think Australia Ooh. are right there in the thick of it. So I, I'm backing the girls to get it done. Great. Any other highlights for you, Trent? Oh, I mean... Ultimately, just last night, uh, on reflection, when I woke up this morning after being on until the early hours on, on air, it was just one of those days where you think about some of the special moments in sport. Ellen Ryan and the lawn bowls in the pairs, the women's pairs, that last bowl in sudden death to win. Then Ollie Hall followed that up. Then, uh, you know, we had gold in the in the rhythmic gymnastics. It was just all happening, you know. I'm just really proud to be Australian and I'm sure you and all of the listeners are as well. Our, our athletes are over there doing us bloody proud so it's been brilliant. Good on you Trent and as I say thank you so much for uh, giving us all the latest staying up for us and um, and hope okay. you have a good nap after this. <laughs> yes I certainly will but I'll be up and cheering tonight. Yay. Go the Aussies. Go Aussies. Trent Copeland there, cricket player, commentator for Channel 7. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. You're with Lisa Leong. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774. Lisa Leong with you on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria and we've been taking your calls this morning of your memories of Judith Durham. You may have heard in the news that she passed away on Friday night. Um, your calls one three hundred triple two seven seven four, or you can text through on 0437 774 774. Julia has texted through, my mother at the age of 90 with dementia could not remember her name but could remember every word of the Seekers songs. Such lovely memories of my mum singing in her squeaky voice. Thank you, Seekers. That's from Julia there. And Janie from Hawthorne, great stories this morning. Thanks. Bopping with my kitten to Georgie Girl. Um, that's Janie from Hawthorne. Annie as well. I was a kid sitting on the grass there at the bowl that afternoon in the 60s with the 200,000 pe uh, people. I introduced my kids to the Seekers and now sing Morningtown Ride with my toddler grandsons. And this now, Morningtown Ride for you, Annie, on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. <laughs>
I may have played the Christmas version. Robin, thank you for letting me know uh, on 0437 774 774. Merry Christmas to you, <laughs> Christmas in August. It's a new thing, didn't you know? Uh, we're taking your calls on 1300 222 774 about your wonderful memories of Judith Durham. Phil, good morning. How are you? Good, thanks. You? Oh, good. You were at the Rock Quiz gig. Yeah, they did a um, a salute to the bowl, they called it, which was ce- celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Maya Music Bowl back in February 2009. Um, so all the whole show and all the questions and everything were related to artists that had played there. And and um, I think I'm, I might be corrected on this, but I think Judith was in poor health leading up to it. But anyway, the, the, she wasn't in the main show, but... The show finished. They did the they did the big finale. All the lights went down. Everyone was in a bit of post-show euphoria, I suppose. And and um and then a single <clears throat> single spotlight came down on the stage, and and Judith was there, and um, she sung the carnival is over, and it was uh, it was an amazing experience. It was um, even my 15 year old. Son at the time was touched, I think. So, really, uh, yeah. that's big. Just want to share that story. <laughs> there was a there was a lot of people there, and uh, there would be some of your listeners that were there. It was it was an amazing uh, thing. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to share that. Oh, thank you, Phil, for sharing yeah. that. And we also we did play the audio a little bit earlier, but let's just play it again, Phil, for you. Yeah. That beautiful moment, oh. Judith Durham. That was Judith Durham at the Rockwiz gig and Phil from Tarragon called in with his memories on 1300 222 774. We'd love to hear from you. 1300 222 774. It begins with a kidnapping. A baby. A girl. Grace will be happier elsewhere anyway. And connects eight strangers on one dramatic day. I told her I will always protect you. Boy, huh? chill boys, huh? relax. Eight new writers, eight stories, one city. I hope in the next life I get to be your daughter again. The critically acclaimed film, Here Out West. All I know is I don't want to be far from home. Sunday night, August 14 on ABC TV and streaming on ABC iView. You're with Lisa Leon. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774. Great to have your company this morning. A couple of months ago, our friend of the show, Dr Tim Dean, came in and shared about his big move to Melbourne and we are now rejoining, connecting again to find out how he's been settling in. Good morning, Tim. Good morning, Lisa. Uh, How are things going in your new home, Melbourne? Look, it's lovely. I'm really starting to feel at home here. Um, in Take, fact, it I, takes a while, doesn't it? It does take a little while. Uh, but I had like my first uh, dinner party with some friends who live in Melbourne last night. In fact, uh, and you know, it's it's those experiences, those personal connections that you can get, uh, which really start to kind of make you feel like you've got a, a network and you've got um, you know friends and people to turn to and to talk to at any time. Uh, and that's been growing. Uh, as I've been, you know, kind of getting around and meeting more people. It's been fantastic. And we spoke about the fact that you've lived in Sydney all your life and you were coming to a new place. And how do you make those new connections? Are there any reflections on how what worked for you and what didn't, maybe? 
Uh, well, look, I will say I still stand by the idea of joining a book club. However, doing so during a pandemic is fraught. I've now had two uh, two book club meetings that have been postponed oh. due to COVID. Um, but we are adamant we are going to make it next week. Uh, but I think it's getting out there. It is. Um, there's there's like a, there's a funny skit in Seinfeld where um, he says like once you get to like your thirties or your forties, you you meet someone and you they're new and you're like hey that was yeah it was really fun should we be friends and you're like you know we're not hiring anymore. <laughs> you know, the, we, the we've shutters got number. come down, and so it actually you, you do get a bit of an entrenched friendship circle once you hit your, I suppose, your thirties or your forties. But there's always new people coming in and out, and in order to uh, to get in and, and meet new people, you've got to stick your neck out a little bit, and you've got to try some new things, and you've got to explore some new experiences. Um, and sometimes that can be a little uncomfortable because we're used to just having a simple friend and family network that we carry with us. Uh, through our lives. But um, through the work that I'm doing and the connections that I've got here, uh, you know, trying some new things, that's where I'm forming these connections and those friendships are starting to grow. Now, I wanted to talk to you this morning about one of the concepts in your fantastic book um, about being human. And the concept, is, well, it involves moral outrage mm. and the capuchin monkeys. Mm -hmm. Can you please take us through um, the experiment with uh, which involved monkeys and cucumber? Oh, yes. This is one of the, the most amazing experiments. And you can actually go on to uh, online. I think it's a <laughs> TED Talk by the, the Dutch primatologist Franz de Waal. Uh, and he shows some footage of this experiment. And what it shows... OK, so I'll set it up. Yeah. So the experimenters have uh, two capuchin monkeys. These are fairly small monkeys. Um, they're very cute, very fuzzy. Uh, and they're in separate um, enclosures. And they've trained these monkeys so that when the researcher hands the monkey a token, uh -huh. like a, a stone, the monkey knows that they can trade that token in for food. And so what we see is we see the researcher hand one of the monkeys in one of the, one of the enclosures a token. And the monkey's like, yep, all right, I'm going to hand this straight back to you and get some food. And so the researcher says, okay, take the token. Here is a piece of cucumber. And the monkey eats the cucumber. It's like, okay, it's a bit boring. It's cucumber, you know, it's mostly water. Pretty happy, though. Yeah. Got something. Got something. And then the researcher goes to the monkey next to the first one. and Who hands, can see the first they monkey. They can both see each other. Yes. Hands that monkey a token. Uh, that, that monkey hands the token back, and it gets food in exchange, except this time it's a grape. A sweet, juicy. juicy grape. And we all know that objectively grapes are superior to pieces of cucumber, right? The monkeys know that too. And the first monkey's like, hang on a second. Hang on. What's this? You can see the first monkey getting a bit agitated. The researcher returns, gives that monkey a token. The first monkey gives it back, expecting a grape this time, and yeah. he gets a cucumber. And the, the, the first monkey you see, I mean, the monkey can't speak, but you can see these expressions that we recognize as indignance as outrage. It checks the token, has a look, is this? Is it real? You know, it's a real token, has another look at the cucumber, has a taste, no, it's definitely not a grape. The monkey gets angry, it slams its little monkey fist on the table and wow. it throws the piece of cucumber at the researcher. And what's really interesting about that is, I mean, there's so much that's interesting about that, but if the monkey was perfectly rational, and we sometimes like to think that, you know, creatures behave in these rational ways. Some food is better than no food. So even though a piece of cucumber is not as good as a grape... Obviously, it a gratitude diary or journal, did it? Yes, yeah, no, it didn't. It, didn't, it wasn't it did kind not. of lodging its privilege. Um, but, it, but some food is better than no food, yet it was still willing to throw that piece of food away in indignance to kind of signal its outrage. So this outrage. is like wiring. This is why this is so interesting. What was happening there? So we can start to see something that we carry with us as well, mm -hmm. which is this feeling when we see an injustice, when we feel like we are wronged, we don't just dispassionately reflect upon it. If somebody gives us a smaller piece of cake than they give themselves, we don't just kind of say, oh, well, some cake is better than no cake. We might get angry. We might reject it. We might push it back. And it's this energy this emotional um, power of outrage that has proven to be a very powerful motivator to actually encourage us to be good people, to be more moral people. We sometimes think of, like, the, the philosophers and psychologists talk about moral emotions, mm -hmm. things like empathy, uh, things like guilt. 
we feel for other people, we want to help them, we, we do something wrong, we know that we've done something wrong, we can understand how they can influence our moral behaviour. But a, 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 an underrated moral emotion is outrage. Because what outrage encourages us to do is it motivates us to correct wrongdoing. If we get angry because there's been an injustice, uh, fighting injustice is a cost. It's difficult. It, it can put us in danger. And that anger is what motivates us to get up and do something about that injustice. And that can encourage us. And it did for primates as well as our ancestors. It encouraged people to police bad behavior and correct those injustices when they saw them. Or throw them out of the fold, as the case may be. Yeah, indeed. Well, one of the, if you're living in a very small scale society where everybody depends on everyone else. So a lot of the societies that existed, you know, 10, 20, 20,000 years ago, um, being pushed out of your society, if you did something wrong and you were ostracised and you were pushed out, that wasn't just social exclusion, which is painful enough. It could have also been deadly because you weren't able to depend on other people to be able to provide for all your basic needs. And so this, this is also one of the reasons why social exclusion does cut so deeply today oh, yeah. when we feel like we've been attacked or pushed out of our social group or ostracised. Um, psychologists talk about people report that being as acute as physical pain when they are socially isolated. But here's the rub. We've taken that and humans take it one step further because we can feel moral outrage on behalf of somebody else, maybe somebody we don't even know. You're absolutely right. And this is the remarkable thing that makes us so special. Is So where that capuchin monkey got outraged at an injustice to, directed towards itself, it doesn't get outraged. Or the other capuchin monkey, for example, that got the grape and didn't get the, the, the cucumber, it could see there was an injustice as well. It didn't care. Because that injustice wasn't directed towards it. But something that we have, something that we have evolved in our minds, in our, in, in, further in our primate um, ancestry after the evolution of those monkeys, was an ability to see an injustice between two people that we have no connection with and we will still get outraged. So if, you're, um, if you hear in the news about, uh, I don't know, let's say somebody who's been scamming the elderly... Um, pretending to be a carer and actually is stealing from them. We are not connected to those individuals, but we can still feel outrage and, and anger when we hear about those kinds of things, even though it doesn't affect us directly. And extrapolating social media, Twitter, what is that playing to? Well, this is where, this is where the social media companies have been incredibly effective at pushing our buttons to create more engagement because when we go onto social media we are exposed to an entire world of outrageous acts an entire world of injustices most of those things don't affect us directly we still care about them but they don't affect us directly but by being exposed to them it triggers our moral outrage it pushes that outrage button intensely and i think a lot of us know that experience of doom scrolling, sitting on social media, scrolling through and just becoming furious and tired and outraged. And you, you, you feel like you want to do something. But the problem with social media, social media is our perception of these things is expanded, but our ability to affect them hasn't really changed that much. What do you mean? Well, if somebody does something in our physical presence, we can speak up. We can interject. We can use our minds, our voices and our bodies to do something about it. If someone does something within our social circles, we can influence our social circles and, and rally the troops to be able to intervene and prevent that kind of thing. If something happens on the other side of the planet to people who are so far removed from us, there's very little that we are able to do to, to correct that injustice. We feel it as acutely as if it's next door to us, but our ability to influence it is really limited. And so what can sometimes happen is people will try to find a way to regain their agency. They'll try to find a way to do something. Sometimes that can be constructive, sometimes rallying a lot of people together through movements like, say, Black Lives Matter or Me Too can generate awareness, can generate a movement to do something. But if you hear about one isolated incident, so this is, there's not much you can do. So people try to dox them. They try to reveal their public identity or they try to get someone fired or they yell at other people or on social media. Them, they try to cancel them. Or all write these... a nasty tweet. And yeah. you're saying, 
looking at this experiment with capuchin monkeys, that it, it is tapping into something um, that is innate in us, moral outrage, and therefore we will be spurred on to do something. Is there any help for us? What could we possibly do then? Well, there's, I think there's a couple of things that we can do. One is to be careful about what we allow ourselves to be exposed to. We do have some control over our social media feeds. We can choose whom to follow. We can choose how often to check our social media. Some of this requires a little bit of discipline. But the, it, I liken it to knowing that if I'm going to be checking social media all the time, getting angry and not being able to do anything about it, I get miserable, you know, I start, you know, the, to the culture gets toxic. If I know that that's unhealthy, but I know that it's really attractive for me to be sitting on social media and getting outraged, it's like leaving a bowl of Tim Tams on the kitchen table. Every time you walk past it, you have to use your willpower to not engage, to not eat the thing that you know is unhealthy. <laughs> so what you can do is, instead of just leaving Twitter there, following all the same stuff, reading all the news, doom scrolling, instead of putting the bowl of Tim Tams on the table, put a bowl of fruit on the table. Follow different people. Have some, create some different habits. Um, you know, read some different news sources. Curate how you engage with the media so you don't have to then suppress the outrage if you can't do something about it. We're speaking with Dr. Tim Dean, freelance philosopher, award-winning writer and teacher, author of How We Became Human on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. You mentioned in passing Tim Tams. Mm. Tell us a story about Tim Tams slams and what that's also tapping into because I feel like it's a really nice parallel with what we're talking about here and moral outrage. Yeah, absolutely. To understand why some of these things affect us so strongly, um, we need to look at how evolution kind of calibrated our senses to be able to respond to the world appropriately. And one of the senses that we have is our sweet tooth. Mm -hmm. So that was very useful in our distant past because sweetness signalled sugar, signalled energy, and, and when you got a pleasurable <laughs> hit from getting a nice ripe piece of fruit... Grapes. Yeah, grapes. It encouraged, it encouraged our ancestors to go and put in extra effort to seek out those particular sources of stimulus because it was good for our bodies. But the amount of sweetness that is in nature is kind of capped, you know, at the fruit level. Um, it, even our ancestors didn't kind of, you know, chew on sugar cane. It was fruit that was really the, the source of sweetness. Now, we have invented much more powerful means of pushing that sweet Lots tooth Lots of button. sweeties. And so, so here we have what I think is one of the pinnacles of human achievement. It's a mixed blessing, the Tim Tam Slam, where you nibble off one end and you Does nibble off the other. This? Yeah, so, so if you don't know, you, you, you chew off the corner of one end of the Tim Tam, then mm -hmm. chew off the corner of the other end. Mm -hmm. Then you dip one corner of Tim Tam into a cup of coffee or hot your beverage. chosen hot beverage, and then you use it like a straw. And you suck the hot beverage through, like for me it's black coffee, you, you suck it through the Tim Tam, and you get this sweetness, you get the creaminess, you and get this kind of, caffeine. it melts, you get the sugar, and then you gobble down the Tim Tam before it, co it just completely disintegrates. And it pushes our sweet tooth button far more intensely than anything in nature could. So it, if we think of fruit as being like a normal stimulus that gives a normal response, like, oh, that was nice, I'll have another piece. You can think of a Tim Tam Slam as a super normal stimulus. It's way above any kind of normal natural stimulus. And it, it pushes our button so intensely that we can kind of get a bit of a red mist or a Tim Tam mist and you can want another one. And we get these in lots of different kinds and of well, contexts. And the interesting thing is we don't stop. Like, it, it, we feel compelled in a way. Yeah, we might can... even do another one, even though that's a really bad idea. Absolutely. I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that I've sat there and ate, eaten too many Tim Tams on more than one occasion. Right. Because you get to, like, number four, and you're like, okay, numbers one and two were pretty great, but, but why, am I, why am I still doing this? I feel, I feel really terrible now. But these super normal stimuli occur in lots of different domains. And to get back to social media, yeah. with our outrage button, um, we are getting exposed to outrageous incidents and injustices and, and terrible things that are going on around the world at a level and intensity that is above what we are normally calibrated to be able to handle. And so it can be overwhelming. It can grab our emotions. It can drive us to, to continue doom scrolling. And it can end up having a tremendous effect on our mental health. And it can also affect the way that we then interact with others, interact with others online. And that can pollute the discourse and create more injustices and it becomes this giant feedback loop where really 
the only winner is the social media companies because they're the ones getting the reward for greater engagement. But it's not making us happier and it's not making the world a better place. So if so, we've got a text through. If I don't buy the Tim Tams, I don't put them in the fridge. So every time I go to the fridge, I won't eat a Tim Tam. So mm. that's one suggestion. Hide them. The other one is Tim Tams and Baelish Irish Cream. Oh, they're going the other way, giving okay. us suggestions. Noted. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you so much, Tim, for your time today, for explaining why we feel so compelled sometimes on social media with the moral outrage, the capuchin mon- monkeys and the Tim Tam Slam. Thank You're you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you. And good luck with uh, your integration into <laughs> Melbourne. Thank you so much. We'll speak to you next time. Friend of the show, Dr Tim Dean, freelance philosopher and award-winning writer and teacher. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. We are asking you for your continued stories, your memories of Judith Durham on 1300 222 774 or you can text through on 0437 774 774. Sammy J. Family legends. What tale has been passed down? In Ballarat, there's a great big victory arch. My father always used to tell us that he kicked a football over it. Now, it's probably about three stories high. There's little girls. We would go, Dad, you kicked a football over that, didn't you? He goes, I did. If you look hard enough, you can see another one I kicked that didn't make it over that's stuck on the top. Breakfast with Sammy J. Weekdays from 5.30 on ABC Radio Melbourne. You're with Lisa Leon. Call 1300 222 774 or text 0437 774 774. Thank you for sharing your incredible memories of Judith Durham. Uh, text here from Sally Ballarat. Hi, Lisa. The first LP I ever bought was The Seekers, and I still treasure and play it. Very sad news. Well, thank you, Sally, for sharing that. And Marie from Altona, what a beautiful tribute. So much emotion and depth of connection. These are the moments that make radio gold. Thank you. That's Marie from Altona. And uh, from Roz here, I nursed Judy at Hampton Rehabilitation Hospital over 30 years ago when she was recovering from an accident. She was an absolute delight and would even entertain the staff and patients with concerts when she was feeling able to do. I will never forget her. May she rest in peace. And Sue from Rosanna has called in on 1300 222 774. Good morning, Sue. Good morning. What's your memory of Judith? Sue. Oh, pull it. It's pulled at my heartstrings this morning because my children are in their thirties now, and I used to rock them to sleep to Morning Town Rye, you know, rock and roll and riding <laughs> just forever. And then I was rocking my granddaughter to sleep recently, and my mm. grandkids with um, the same tune. So yeah, and those kids, my own children, don't forget the words of that song either. So wonderful. Oh, thank you, Sue. And say with me, I think I was rocked to sleep uh, to the Morning Town Ride as well. Uh, listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria, and Maureen has joined us from Phillip Island. Hello, Maureen. Hi. What's your memory of Judith, Maureen? Well, well Judith, um, um, when I was a teenager, she was on a cruise ship before she and the rest of the Seekers, they were all on this cruise ship plane. Um, oh, and we travelled around Numia and CG and then we got back to Melbourne and then they left to go to England and of course history was made with their beautiful, her beautiful singing and their beautiful backing. Amazing. Thank you, Maureen from Phillip Island, taking your calls on one three hundred triple two seven seven four. as we remember Judith Durham. Uh, text here on 0437 774 774. Katie from Clunes. When I was a child, my grandparents had a pianola and the most popular scroll played was Georgie Girl. All of us cousins absolutely loved it. We'd challenge each other to play it faster and faster so we could play it again. It was the best. I named my daughter Georgia. I wonder if I did this subconsciously. Oh, Katie from Clunes, thank you for your beautiful text message. Or you can give us a call on 1300 222 774 with your memories of Judith Durham. This one here, Chris... My dad loved watching and listening to Judith. 
when he passed away in 1994, The Carnival Is Over was played at his service, says Chris. And Helen from Ocean Grove says, My favourite Seekers song was Lady Mary. It really shows up the beautiful quality of Judith's voice. And that's Helen from Ocean Grove. Thank you so much. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Lend us your ears and experience a world of audio content with ABC Listen. A world of sound. Like the new pop culture podcast, Schmeichgeist, decoding the biggest trends this year. I saw a trend happening on TikTok basically I've never seen before. Trash reality TV. It is my favourite thing in the world. And for the kids, Dynadome. T-Rex is ahead. Check out those lunges. The ABC Listen app. Lend me your ears. Download it now from your app store. You're listening to ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. You can give us a call on 1300 222 774 or you can uh, text in on 0437 774 774. Right now on the ABC, we've got George Michael with Faith. Lisa Leon, ABC Radio, Melbourne and Victoria. After the news, ABC Grandstand, where you'll have the Brisbane versus Carlton game this afternoon. That's on Analog and over on Digital Editor's Choice with James O'Brien. Uh, your text through on 0437 774 774. My fond memories of Judith and the Seekers started back in 1969, Heathrow Airport, London, while waiting with my mum and dad to migrate to Australia, listening to Georgia Girl. It gave me a warm sense of welcome going to Australia and that memory has never left me. Cheers for now. Alex there and David from Baldwin. 
Judith Durham, truly one of the finest voices Australia has produced. Everyone should check out The Seekers at the AFL Grand Final. It's on YouTube. Sends uh, tingles down your spine. Judith was marvellous. My favourite singer, says Peter from Mont ABC. Albert. I missed a huge concert at the My Music Bowl, but I went to all their other reunion concerts. Thank you so much. <laughs> ABC News with Mary McDonald. Good afternoon. A man has died in police custody in Melbourne's north this morning. Helen Vines reports. Officers were called to Murphy Street in Preston amid reports a car had crashed through a fence and into the front yard of a home around four o'clock. Police say the man was agitated and confronted officers when he got out of the car. They attempted to restrain him before he appeared to become unresponsive. The officers called for medical assistance and performed CPR, but the man couldn't be revived. Detectives from the Homicide Squad will investigate the incident with oversight from Professional Standards Command, which is standard practice when a person dies in police custody. China's embassy in Canberra has condemned Australia, the United States and Japan for their stance on Beijing's military exercises around Taiwan. Stephanie Dalzell reports. The three countries have accused China of international peace and stability by conducting large-scale drills, including firing ballistic missiles over Taiwan following US House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to the island last week. Government frontbencher Chris Bowen has told Nine News the actions are concerning. This action by China is is disproportionate and it's destabilising. A spokesperson for the Chinese embassy in Australia has argued China is the victim of ongoing provocation by the United States. The federal government has dismissed claims its decision to grant a Tamil asylum seeker family permanent visas will encourage people smugglers. The Nata Salingham family had been living in Biloela in regional Queensland since June on bridging visas after spending four years in immigration detention. On Friday, Immigration Minister Andrew Giles granted them permanent visas, prompting the coalition to declare it would set a high-profile precedent. But Labor frontbencher Annika Wells has told Sky News the government has honoured its election commitment. The opposition might make that that argument. They made that argument for years and years when they could have put this family at ease with the stroke of a pen. Uh, Minister Giles demonstrated yesterday that it really was that simple. I go based on what my constituents tell me and what my constituents have told me is that they are relieved that we have shown a bit of compassion. Israel has accused an Islamic terrorist group of launching rockets that fell short and hit a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip, killing four children. As cross-border clashes continue into a third day, Hamas, who controls the Palestinian territory, blamed Israel for the rockets. But Israel has distributed a video that appears to show one rocket being launched from Gaza at night and then veering immediately off course and down into a built-up area. Government spokesperson Karen Hadjioff says terrorist groups like Islamic Jihad have had a long history of hiding behind civilians to target Israel. The world should be outraged at this terrorist group targeting innocent Israelis and killing innocent Gazans. Israel will continue to stand up to this vicious terrorist organisation which threatens Israelis and Palestinians alike. The Seekers lead singer Judith Durham is being remembered as an Australian icon with the voice of an angel as news of her death brings tributes from around the world. Yvette Gray reports. Judith Durham is being remembered for her sweet voice, kindness and humility. The 79-year-old died in palliative care in Melbourne on Friday night after complications from chronic lung disease. Her Seekers bandmates, Athel Guy, Bruce Woodley and Keith Potcher, say their lives have been changed forever through losing their treasured lifelong friend and shining star. Potcher remembers the first time he heard Durham sing. I was just uh, absolutely knocked out uh, with, with her voice. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese says Australia has lost a national treasure and icon who helped blaze a trail for a new generation of Aussie artists. More than 1.2 million Victorians have applied for the state government's $250 power saving bonus. The rebate is available to all Victorians who visit the Energy Compare website to find the best power supply deals in their area. Energy Minister Lily D'Ambrosio says they will also provide additional funding to services who can assist Victorians who have difficulty applying for and receiving the cash rebate. Uh, we know that Victorians are doing it tough and that's why the power saving bonus is so important. It's available to every Victorian household, no matter what your circumstances are. 
And briefly in sport, Australian tennis player Nick Kyrgios is through to the final of the ATP Tour event in Washington, D.C. To the weather now for the state, a dry and partly cloudy day in the far northwest, mostly cloudy elsewhere with isolated showers tending scattered about Gippsland and the eastern ranges. For Melbourne, partly cloudy, the high chance of showers about the Dandenongs with a medium chance elsewhere with a top today of 14 degrees. Tomorrow, partly cloudy, 13. Tuesday, becoming sunny, also 13. Wednesday, cloud increasing and 16. Right now in Melbourne, it's 13 degrees. ABC News.